The way I'm approaching this presentation is you're the protagonist, not me. Um, this lecture is about you, not me. And it's my challenge to you that this idea that you, the audience, have the capacity to improve health and social science research. And you can do that by modeling it explicitly as complex. Um, I also want to just quickly thank Emma for the opportunity to be here in the ESRC. Um, it's great to be able to um, work across, um, across international lines and, um, and have this opportunity to be here and do this type of work. So it's very exciting for me um, and um, we'll just sort of jump in. So uh, when you think about, I think part of the problem, Friedrich Kapper says this in The Web of Life that Part of the reason that we as social scientists and health scientists have had such a hard time getting to complexity is because what we do actually works really well, right? And so it's not that, it's not as if what we're doing isn't working, it's not as if statistics doesn't work. So when I'm teaching statistics to students, students say, well, I don't understand, Dr. C, you said that, you know, we got to do all this other stuff. I'm not saying the other stuff doesn't work, it's just that when we're looking at the 21st century, we see that complexity has become a key issue. And, and that requires you as the audience to make an adjustment to how you're doing things. And when I say complex, I mean obviously everything that we see in our daily lives. Um, globalization, climate change, cyber infrastructure, the work Emma does in big data, data science, uh, global population, and even significant ships for my area in health, community health, public health, mental health, even shifts in the human microbiota and microbiome we're even seeing. Um, and it has a lot to do with this issue of um, complexity. Um, when I say we need to embrace complexity, Capra again makes this point in um, The Web of Life and uh, Byrne and Callahan make this point in the most recent book. We're not saying that suddenly we discovered the world's complex. That's not the issue here. It's the idea that we're actually specifically, as Laza was pointing out at the beginning of his presentation, we're specifically thinking about things as complex. And then by definition, that means we have to go to this issue, um, and Stephen Hawking had said this idea as well, um, we have to go to this issue of what does complexity mean? Uh, I'm just throwing up a map. Um, Laze um, intimated at this and Emma intimated at this that this is the way everyday life around us happens. Um, I have a 15-year-old and this is the world she lives in. They, they network, they text, they're, they're moving data, they talk across international lines, they're, they're, in, they're tweeting, they're in this virtual world. Um, and this specific explicit field called the complexity sciences has emerged. Um, if you type in my name, Brian Castellani, uh, sociology and complexity, or just type in complexity and map, you'll find this. Um, it's up there, it's an electronic um, internet-based map. Um, and if you type in, by the way, just for those, so you, I like this when presenters do this, um, I put up a blog post and all three of our um, PDFs are up there of our PowerPoints. So just Castellani, sociology, complexity blog and you'll be able to pull up everything that we've been talking in some links, uh, links to Graham's book and other things too. Um, so this field has emerged, and as Emma said, there's the typical sort of sense of when we say we're going to explicitly embrace something as complex, what do we mean? Well, we mean the things that Emma um, listed, but more important, it's what Emma was getting at, is that first of all, we're thinking about these ideas as situated within different systems. I say to my students, you have a uh, patient talking to the doctor. And let's just say it's an a elderly woman with dementia talking to the physician about how she's doing. Now let's change the setting. They're in a medical office. They're at her home, right? They're out in, um, out in the field somewhere uh, doing public health research. Those three different contexts entirely change the situation, right? So it's not the idea that we can simply study something without studying its context. Yet we do that all the time. Um, my, my background comes, um, my training is in clinical psychology. I worked for 10 years as a clinician and I was trained primarily in methods and statistics. And never once did I model the context, right? Never once did I think about 
what's the context in which, and I studied um, addiction, what's the context in which the addiction's taking place? We were doing this study, I worked at the Veterans Administration Medical Center in the United States, and we were looking at veterans at one year post-treatment. Um, Nick knows work in addiction, right, in all this area we talked about, and, and, and um, all sorts of situations like this. The patients at one year post-treatment, 75% uh, relapse, 50% recidivism, that's return to treatment. The context in which these um, vets went back to was dismal, right? Insecure housing, insecure employment, insecure um, financial situation, which ultimately led them back to their drug of choice, which was their primary coping mechanism, and they relapsed. That context was never part of the treatment plan. It was never part of all the models that were built, right, to understand the lives of these individuals. Then when, and this is where um, it becomes important, is then when those individuals came back, they were penalized for that. Why didn't you stay sober? Why didn't you stay clean? Because of a sort of reductionistic notion of what accounted for, as Lasley was saying, the pathway that got them from you're clean and sober to you're back to your addiction of choice. Also this idea that they're evolving differently across time space, that no two situations, um, in Laze's example, of these different mega projects, right, they're, they're distinct projects. Um, and so they're evolving across time space in different ways, and they're leading to different trends. I want to challenge you in terms of the way you think about your work. Do you tend to think about one key trend, one key way, one key um, average that, that represents the group with then marking anything that moves away from that as a deviation, right? Um, an easy example, this is in, in cancer treatment. We set up a cancer protocol and we proceed with patient coming in. Well, we're gonna give you all of these drugs. We're gonna give you bleomycin, we're gonna give you all these different really, really dangerously strong drugs because we know that 80% 80, 80 of the people will survive as a result of taking them. What about the 20% that don't? Well, this is the way we do it. As Emma said and as Lazio said, we walk down our algorithm because we're walking down a basic guideline of probability theory, right? And we're saying this decision, then that decision, this is the average, this is the average, this is the average. And then we get to here and the patient is dying. They're not the average, they're that 20%. And then we go, what do we do? And then we run to the journals and we look for the cases. We look for the cases that are distinct and unique and we say, oh, that's the unique case, but it's too late. The trajectory should have been acknowledged back here as Laze saying, when the differences were meaningful, had manifested themselves, and we're already telling you, this is on a pathway to disaster. This project, this policy, as in Graham Arun's book, you know, these, right, these ideas that policies are moving, a actors are agile, we, we need to be able to move in the same way and respond to the problems that present themselves to us. And it's quite difficult to do, unless we are from the beginning explicitly modeling the idea that there is more than one path here. And that just because someone's not meeting the average doesn't mean it's a deviation. A deviation from what? From another path. That's all it is. It's just a deviation from another path. It's not a deviation. It's not a deviation. When I bring medical students in and I teach them, I say, here's the physician desk reference, right? Up here, these small little thin legal paper, you know that, whatever, I don't know what the heck legal paper's made of, but it's damn thin, right? And it's just all the drugs. And then I go, well, what, why is the book this thick? It's all the side effects, <laughs> right? Because people deviate from our created average which doesn't actually exist. But we, we, we model it as if it does. Therefore, we need cl different clinical and community-based responses to the fact that there is no average. This then demands different method. And this is why I'm challenging you. You can do this. I started off as a statistician, clinical psychologist. You couldn't be more in the box right, as far as like, 
you know, patients' lives are at stakes. We must follow the follow protocols and this is what we must do. And if I tell my supervisor we're gonna do something different, I better damn well know why, right? And I remember a friend of mine who kind of has always known that maybe I'm a bit, of a, bit more of a freak than the box <laughs> I'm allowed, had given me this, this card. This was back in 1992. It was a neural net. It was some software program, right? So back then, before Apple took over, right, you actually had to run things on hard drives and put your floppy disks in. And, and I got this neural net program. No clue how to use it, but I said, one day I'm going to figure this damn thing out. So you can do this. These methods, they have an initial sort of, uh, oh my God, you know, I, I, okay. But they're really, they are, you can learn them and you can actually apply them. And then there's lots of us over here um, who are more than happy if you give us a call or email us to help you. <laughs> I think it's we're like, hey, you know, we can, we can do this. So I want to challenge you about that. And there's examples of this complexity all around us. And I'm going to kind of just move um, fast through this. Um, big study um, in the New York Times was following the study about the fact that uh, autoimmune disease is not um, evolving um, the way it should be. And it's evolving differently within different societies. Um, we know the spread of obesity network by Christakis and Fowler. Um, very fascinating study using computational methods. Um, I'm a hypochondriac as well. <laughs> and, uh, my family lives in New York City. <laughs> and so I'm constantly on the thing, don't touch the subway. You know, ah! <laughs> and I'm like, Castellani, you're such a freak. And then uh, this study came out, I'm like, they don't even know what half these microbes are. They're <laughs> like, some of the bacteria we've identified, we don't even know what the other stuff is. So I, was, I just came from New York City, I'm on the subway like, uh, just get me to JFK. <laughs> if you don't believe me, go look at Christopher Mason's work. <clears throat> All right, and then a plug for CCAN and other things. I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Journal of Artificial Societies. Um, David Byrne in Callahan's book, Philip Hayes on this, and then um, Graham's book. So reiterating Emma's point, we're not focused on variables. We're not focused on simple aggregate averages. Um, we're not reductionistic. Um, we're not static. And we're not focused on one size fits all clinical model. So just rehashing what we've said up to this point. Um, an example of this was um, a study that we just did on place and health as complex systems. And we we're looking at this area called Summit County. And you can see this circle here, an area called Akron. And um, this is an urban center that had on average compared to the more affluent communities like Hudson, anywhere between seven to, to 13 years of life loss per death difference, which is pretty significant for the states. What was also fascinating though, because of the linear models that were used to, to deal with this issue, the fact was that after several years of doing pretty intense work, on 13 of the 19 measures that were examined, roughly 68% things were worse or the same. And for me, that's when I start to say, something needs to be done differently, right? Something needs to change in terms of how we're modeling things. So again, just to reiterate um, what um, Emma and Laze were saying, there's something old and there's something new here. The old is the idea that we're studying cases. This isn't new. And when I talk with public health folks, we understand we, public health medicine is about the case. Right? Um, but then this obvious usage of computation, machine intelligence, and so forth. And it's led my colleagues and I to develop this approach which we call case-based complexity, which is based on the work of David Byrne, and then also based on um, a gentleman in the States by the name of Charles Reagan, and that's where Laze was referring to QCA, which are these uh, qualitative approaches. And I strongly recommend you check uh, Reagan's work out because you don't have to just do computation to do this work. Um, a, a qualitative is important. In that study on public health that I'll get to, um, I'll make that point very clear. But we've been building this new method and that's what I just want to demonstrate to you very quick. Here was a study that we first did on allostatic load. So allostatic load is a bio, biological measure of 
the stress and strain of daily living on our lives. It's a very um, hardy and um, robust empirical way to measure um, the, Im the negative impact that stress has. And to begin, we were able to model allostatic load as a complex system. We could look at the socio-ecological factors in which individuals are situated. Are they in positions of poverty? Are they in urban environments? Are they dealing with um, exposure to toxic elements, for example, you know, living near industrial areas? And then we could go down to the psychological level and even the biological. And at the biological level, we could even then take a whole series of biomarkers and combine those biomarkers. Again, using very conventional methods, we use factor analysis to create profiles uh, of complexity. Then we can also identify major and minor trends. Uh, this is a study that we're doing. Uh, Emma um, and myself um, um, were on the first phase and now this uh, second study that we're looking at um, is building on it, um, looking at uh, primary care, depression and primary care, and able to model multiple trajectories. When you think of depression, when I learned about depression, you think of people get depressed, right? <laughs> uh, people meet the diagnosis for clinical depression. But as Laze was saying, no. The lived experience of depression is not the same for everybody. It's different. What are those trends? That's what a clinician wants to know, right? That's what a public policy person wants to know. I remember a good friend of mine saying, Brian, I just don't read the literature. I think it's really cool what you do, but I don't read it. And I said, why? Because it doesn't make a difference in terms of what I do. And that was one of those, ouch, right? <laughs> like, okay, so I'm spending my life writing this stuff. Because his response was, I need to, what's the different pathways? What do I, what would I do differently? If I read your study, how would I do things differently? And that's the idea is, and then we even get down into multiple trends, minor trends, which is a big point that Emma and um, some of her colleagues make is this idea of N of one cases, N of three cases. These are not any less important, right, as case trajectories than the large ones that um, consume the majority. Now, just to make the point here, this is just quickly in terms of complexity, and how, how am I on time? Like about two minutes? Yeah, two, three minutes, but maybe you can say the methods of this. Okay, so this is what is called a topographical neural net, okay? Um, and a topographical neural net is a very intuitive, visually intuitive way of representing data, and this is a big point in Emma's work on data visualization and big data, big data science. What's really nice is these are the 11 trajectories of depression that we modeled in our study. So you can see healthy down here, unhealthy with these people called oscillators. You know, if you think about uh, uh, maybe a city in a poverty trap, it gets better, then it gets worse, then it gets better, then it gets worse. Patients who start to get better, but they get worse. Good days, bad days, chronic illness, right? All these sorts of things. Each single one of these is a case. So there is at no point in the study that I have ever reduced the complexity. You say, but Brian, where's case 7564? Right here. What trajectory does 7564 belong to? Belongs at a healthy. Well, what's the region that he belongs in? Well, I can actually tell you because this is a three-dimensional topographical map. It's based on basic geometry. So that means things that are further away from each other are less like each other. Things that are closer are more like each other. So not only do I know the 11 trajectories, I know which trajectories look like each other. And then I can actually create a relief map that shows me these patients sit way down here in the valley. These sit up on this real high ridge of difference, right, of, of case-based difference. And I can use that to, to make, um, and I can sit, and I sit down with physicians and I sit down with the clinicians and they're like, got it, right? It's very powerful visually. I don't have to show them any numbers, which they like, right? <laughs> no numbers, there's no p-value. It's literally the population, <laughs> okay? Then we can do this, we can aggregate the trends and actually look for even more deeper notions of what's going on. One of the problems we run into with policy, right, is you make an implementation to change something, but it only goes so far. Well, what you haven't actually recognized is that particular set of trajectories are stuck in a spiraling source. And then I can actually tell you the speed at which they move into them. So not only can I model for you the trajectory, I can say as it's getting closer, it's, it's going like that. 
right? And then to get them out of the problem, it might be slow at first, and then they get a little bit better, and then they get better and better and better and better and better, right? So you think of economies that are trying to scale up, for example, that are trying to improve um, their situation. Um, and then lastly, we can create these wonderful profiles that you can actually hand to people. Again, very highly visually useful. I can hand this to a clinician or a policy person based off, this will be just a visual representation of what Lazi was doing. This is the profile that works. This is the profile that doesn't. Well, what about this? Oh, I've got that one too. Here's, here's the 22 profiles of working projects. Here's the, oh no wait, 22, pro, 22 ways to screw up. <laughs> I really think you need to go with that title. <laughs> Um, and then finally, we can use this to um, build models. In that study, um, we actually built an agent-based model and modeled it. But what was fascinating was this is a plug for the qualitative. We found out that, so in these impoverished communities, they were struggling to get out of their um, situation, their poverty trap. But no matter what, you got one minute? No matter what they did, they could not get out of it because the larger uh, suburban environments in which their poverty took place just kept getting better. So you improve their economy, the more affluent environments improve their economy. Well, what do you want to do when you live in an environment like that? You want to move out there. Where do the hospitals go? They go out there. This is the problem in the states, why we end up with such levels of inequality. The public health, pouring, pouring money in there, it's for naught. They didn't model it as complex. Um, I'll leave it at that and um, we'll stop. But um, I really challenge you, these, these methods can be learned, um, they can be embraced, and, and they do make a difference. So we'll stop there. <laughs>